Hello and welcome to day one of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Well, here at Davos, we like to have little breakout sessions where perhaps ideas can develop. And this is one of them, a half hour in which we're allowed to explore some perhaps new territory, territory which isn't touched on very often when you're talking about business or politics. Now, in this session, what we're going to do is talk about physics and chemistry and perhaps how those topics can be used to solve some of the problems that the world is facing today. Well, joining me here for this session is Alma Sowell, who is a Nobel laureate and really your background or what you teach is physics and chemistry. You have, uh, you're from, you, you come from Egypt, so there's plenty to say about that uh, world of politics and what's happening there. Let me, let me ask you, first of all, when you see what's happening in the world of economics, which, which is causing a fundamental rethink, do you draw on your scientific background to, to, to come up with some solutions in your own more mathematical way? I don't know if I can come up with some <laughs> solutions, but I can reflect on it. I, I do think that the, uh, that the gap between the half and the half knots now is so huge uh, that we all have to think about new ways of how to help the have-nots. Um, I think it's not new to you and your audience that 80% of the population on this planet Earth are in the have-nots, less than $2 a day or about. And so we have to find new ways. Um, and in my views, science is critical for this. You advise Barack Obama, he's just given his uh, State of the Union address, in which he talks about exactly this, about fairness. But it's not just about giving to have-nots, it's about empowering them. Exactly. And you believe that comes through education. Exactly. Uh, if you look on some just very recent statistics right now, um, more than 500 million children on this planet Earth will not be able to go to school. Uh, and so if you are going to have economic development in the world, you can't have it in the world market of today, as we're seeing in Davos, uh, without empowering these people with some education. And so it's not a question really of just giving them money or aids. I think we should work very hard through a partnership. I called it in some of my writings, it's a true partnership from the developed world into the developing world. Now, science is a big topic. I know that's where you think much of the teaching needs to be done, but what aspects of science do you think are particularly empowering? Well, let me just give you a concrete example. You know, the United States, there are estimates by some fellow uh, economists in the world of today that the war in Iraq co cost something about four trillions let's say one trillion, and that's a thousand billion dollars. Imagine if we took 10% of this, which is a hundred billion, and just for the region, for example, in the Middle East, what we could have done was a hundred billions in ways of education, centers of excellence in science, trying to help these people to empower them, solve some problems in energy, water resources, uh, reform of education of the 21st century. So it seems to me it's not a question of money really, it's a question if we are very serious and sincere. It's about a question what, of reprioritizing. Uh, exactly, and being determined to solve the problem. Does education have a role to play in diplomacy? Oh, there is no doubt, and in fact I have written an article called uh, uh, Science and Diplomacy because I think that if we can get uh, diplomacy to be as strong utilizing education as we will do, let's say, with the military forces that we provide, it seems to me we'll have a better world than what we have. Do you today. have a more concrete idea of how that would work? Is it a transfer of information, a transfer of expertise? How do you go into countries, developing countries, poorer countries, and start teaching people when perhaps their needs sometimes are even more basic than that? Well, you know, I'm reminded by a statement that Nehru made uh, when somebody, this is more than 50 years ago, and somebody stand up to Nehru and said, how can you speak about building the Indian Institutes of Technology and we don't have clean water? 
And Nehru's answer, something to the effect <coughs> that the reason we don't have clean water is because we don't have science. And so it seems to me it's a vicious cycle in the sense that unless we really empower these people and improve on the way that they can do this, whether you are in Africa or in Asia or Latin America, I think we'll be staying in the same situation. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're from Egypt. Egypt is a country which has a very large young population. And of course, as we know, has been through a, a very difficult, turbulent period, which is not done yet, not by any manner of means. What would you, how would you use education now? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say that it's uh, very difficult. Actually, I'm very optimistic about Egypt. Um, today is the anniversary of the, of the revolution. Um, and if you see, uh, if you read history and find out what happens usually after revolutions, it's very ugly. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're familiar with in Europe, mm -hmm. with the French Revolution and mm -hmm. the like. I think despite all of these difficulties that took place in Egypt, it seems to me still, as we say in physics, the slope is positive. Mm -hmm. it's, still, it's still going in the right direction. And I think Egypt will get out of this. Uh, but better democracy, we just yesterday or day before yesterday had the first uh, elected parliament in more than 50 years in the history of the But country. would you now be going into Egypt at this time of great change and saying what we need is, is education well, and science I, even I, now? Is that the time? I'll actually? give you a, a, a personal story about this. For 12 years I've tried with the old regime to get education and science as a priority in the country since I received the prize in 1999. And we got nowhere. It was only after the revolution last year that, in fact, we have now a whole new city called Zuel City of Science and Technology. And it's going into uh, new areas of education. It's going into the modern age of the 21st century. The government has approved a special decree for it. The young people are very excited. And the Egyptian people are donating money we collected up to now close to a billion uh, Egyptian pounds. So it's, it's not bad. What was the response in Egypt from the political elite to you getting the prize? Well, you know, you will be surprised, and this is not to put a block for Egypt, but uh, my son, who's at Georgetown uh, in the United States, he always reminds me that <clears throat> the way the Egyptians receive a scientist is like a rock star. It's, it's not in the Western world. Scientists don't get this high level of appreciation. But in Egypt, maybe it's a historic, uh, maybe for a variety of reasons, people still value very, very much. So the day I was receiving the prize in Stockholm, they tell me there wasn't too many people on the streets in Cairo. <laughs> do <laughs> do, um, do scientists need to be made into rock stars all over the world, do you think? I mean, you know, if you go to somewhere like Germany, doctors are revered, I think, a little bit more than they might be elsewhere in Europe. Especially England. Yeah, uh, well, exactly. I, yeah, well, I'll tell you, uh, this is one of my concerns. As you know, I live both in the West and the East. Uh, I think that's one of my concerns about the West. I think there's a feeling in the West that we now have the end of the knowledge and we don't need to invest in knology anymore. And I think this is something that... Uh, well, I think, think that's something now, carefully. perhaps this week, that people will be convinced that is not the case. I mean, from an economic point of view, we're at the end of an era where there's been enormous, for example, the rise of China has kept inflation down and growth high, uh, global growth <laughs> higher. We've seen um, enormous developments in the world of telecommunications uh, with the Internet uh, at the center of that. And that's kept productivity high, inflation low and growth high. But we're coming to the end of that era now. Do you think physics or chemistry have the next wave of innovation to offer such that we can propel the, the world economy forward? Yeah, I'll answer th this is an important question. I'll answer this, but let me just say that uh, where you see people are interested in going into science and the engineering is in Asia and in countries like Egypt, actually. Uh, but on the other hand, in UK and in USA, uh, the numbers is dropping, as a matter of fact. So there is some concern there. Now, regarding your questions, many, many books have been written <coughs> about the... Uh, Can I just stop you there? We yes. have, a, I have a worry about your microphone not working. Is it working now? Yes? No, it's not working. 
Maybe that's a signal to end the problem. <laughs> yeah. Fair. Exactly. We have a real life failure of science. Right okay. Um, so let's pick up then. You were talking about <coughs> perhaps the lack of glamour attached to uh, engineering. Well, there is, there is books and books have been written about the end of science and the idea that we are at the end of the roads in certain areas. I frankly give it very little weight. I think that what is really incredible about science is the unpredictability of science. And uh, I've written uh, a piece in Nature about the issue uh, that it's all in curiosity. <coughs> if you give the right education and you're curious, you will find somebody that's 26 years old or 22 years old and coming up with a brand new idea that might transform the world that neither you nor I have thought about it. So that you can't say in the ocean of knowledge that there will be an end, for example, for this or that. We have no idea. Let me give you an example. Do you know that more than 98% of our universe is dark? We don't know much about it. So we only know less than 2%, including galaxies and stars and, and the like, all of the planets, everything. It's only less than 2% that we know. So the discoveries are really up to, once you educate the people in the right direction and you plant the elements of innovation, you will always find the new things in science. What about all of this um, particle physics that we're seeing at the moment, neutrinos and, and, uh, and such like? It's really hard for a lot of people to understand why that's relevant to them. Mm -hmm. is, is particle physics relevant to us? Apart from the fact that we wouldn't be able to stand up unless we had it. You know. well, uh, well, again, it's a good question, but I would say this. I would say that knowledge per se is extremely important if you're thinking about investment in the future. Mm -hmm. Because any person who will tell you, including Nobel Prize winners, that they know what's going to come perhaps more than 10 years ahead of time is not really, they don't know. We don't have a crystal ball to know that. So we don't know if there is going to be a new particle that will be discovered that will revolutionize the sources of energy that we are looking for. We have no idea. Uh, we don't know what is the origin of our species. We might discover something at very high energy. So knowledge for the sake of knowledge we have to invest in. But if you're asking me with particle physics tomorrow, produce something for the benefits of health or energy. Tomorrow, I'm not really sure, mm. but we have to invest in it. Okay. Are there any questions immediately coming from the... Yes, gentlemen, if you could tell me where you're from and your name and stuff. Uh, my name is Mickey Pant. I live in the U.S. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Young Brands, basically we're a restaurant. We have a lot of restaurants in Egypt. Mm. Young Brands, yeah. yeah. We Very well known, yeah. Um, firstly, thank you, Professor, for your comments. It's a privilege to hear you speak. The question is about uh, the students that you see today uh, as you teach um, in college. Uh, and compared to the time students at the time when you were a student, I'm guessing 40 years ago, in terms of capability and their attitude, do you see a difference? It wasn't, it was 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, I no, I think you're right, actually. But <laughs> it depends which stage you're talking about. But, um, has there been a change in, uh, well, you know, it's always nostalgia. You know, we always go back and say we were better than our this and that. So it's very hard to answer this objectively. But I'll tell you one thing from a personal experience. I was involved in the Egyptian revolution. I saw what's happening in Tahrir Square. If you ask me two months before the revolution about Egyptian youth, I would have told you all kind of things <laughs> about you know, they are not like our old uh, generations and this and that. But when you sit with these people and you saw what they have done and by way of what they used in the information technology and how disciplined they were, you will have to tip your hat. So I think every generation have their own way of doing things. And I think that's the way we probably survive as a species. Yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Mohammed al Haram from Egypt. Mohammed al Haram from Egypt, and I run a social enterprise that focuses on education for children from 6 to 12. And the more we study the curriculums that are there in different countries, the more we find that it pushes students to not practice critical thinking. Uh -huh. 
it's very restricting because mm -hmm. it's very, there's one answer, it's at the end of the book and you're not supposed to look at it. And when you make it an alternative educational <laughs> system, it's very expensive to be honest, to make it based on mentorship and an open curriculum. So do you have any idea how can we develop critical thinking in a cost effective manner that is not mm -hmm. expensive because mm -hmm. if you look at around the countries that are doing that, they're spending a lot of money in there. Right. How can we make something cost effective? You, you will be intrigued on this council of President Obama. Uh, one of the things, we are a small group and one of the things is critical for our study is also critical thinking of American students. In other words, the problem is not only in the developing world, it's even in the developed uh, world. Because why? The inventions are huge. You're talking about Wikipedia and you're talking about MySpace and the other. So the education that we used to, the blackboard, the whiteboard, all of that stuff, is gone. Uh, my son, before he went to college, he, you know, if he wants to solve a quadratic equation, he just put it in the computer, even <laughs> without thinking. And uh, we used to do it by hand and think about it and so on. So you will have to develop a new ways. And I have seen new experiments in Malaysia, in Turkey, that are outstanding. And you have to develop, uh, for example, I've seen one in Turkey where you actually sit down and you see the actual experiment of Isaac Newton with the apple coming down in you, but you are in a virtual laboratory. You really have to rethink about all of this and the traditional way are essentially gone right now. Yes, please, this gentleman here. Uh, my name is Salim Ali. I'm a professor of environmental science at the University of Vermont. Um, and uh, I'm interested in this issue of religion and science because as a Muslim American um, and someone who firmly believes in scientific enterprise, I find it very challenging working with um, my fellow Muslims on some of the more difficult but fundamental issues in science. And the most notable example is evolution. Uh, mainstream Muslims still refuse to work with evolution, even though you know there are, of course, several clerics who would be willing to move forward. And you get marginalized, you get ostracized, even by bringing it up. And you can't even advance in fundamental biology without working on it. So how are you dealing with that? Mm. Well, this, uh, uh, it is a fundamental issue. Um, the basis of it, again, is in education. But I, again, I want to remind you uh, that I live in America, as you know, and in, in Kansas, there was a vote by the board not to teach evolution. So it's every place you're going to go I was just going to say, it's not just Islam. Uh, yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, so it's, it's, I uh, think the difference is that in those cases, you know, you will have a majority consensus in the other right. community, which will marginalize those extremists. But in Islam, we're talking about the dominant majority. Yeah, it's central. Will, mm -hmm. will actually push you I, th I, think, I think there are two forces that will change mm -hmm. that, and I'm very hopeful about that. A, is that the Muslim world is living and have lived for a long time under dictatorship. And, and they used religion in order to get their own way. Mm -hmm. I think when you have true democracies and exchange of ideas and this and that, you will have the majority and the minority there. I think the second point, which is extremely important to the Muslim world, is education. Education in the Muslim world is not up to the standards of what they used to be thousand years ago. And so there are dogmas, there are lack of understanding, there is a confusion about what's said in Quran. All of this has to be clarified. And the, the hopeful sign that I can tell you that when somebody speaks, at least I have seen this in my experience, in the Muslim world and speaks to the mind and in a fair way, people receive that very well. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that that can change. Yes, please. Another one from this side. This lady back here. before that in the United States there has been a plateauing and in fact in certain areas a drop off in interest by students in pursuing science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, I'd be interested to know if you have any ideas or observations where you've seen it work in places as you, through your travels, um, things that we could implement in the United States. For example, I know some schools are trying to have more practical applications at the high school or primary school level, but I don't know which ones work. Strategies to get people interested. Right. I, well, I, as you know, I'm sure it, it, it begins with the, with the school itself. There are two aspects of this, at least 
thinking about it quickly. Uh, one is that uh, teachers at school now in the United States uh, are not truly well equipped with the beauty of science and why you teach science. And I think you have to completely uh, change the situation. They need to be paid better and uh, uh, trained well. Uh, Finland, for example, uh, a teacher in science uh, take a sabbatical uh, and go and learn about the modern science that's happening. So that's really one aspect. I think the second aspect is the leadership in the country. I think I arrived in the States in 69 when President Kennedy was saying we are going to the moon. And everybody wanted to go to science at the time, mm -hmm. or essentially everybody mm -hmm. wanted to go to science. But when now Wall Street comes first and uh, making money comes first and all of that stuff, you're not going to get science. Yeah, but do time. you now have an opportunity, given that Wall Street yeah. is is a little bit out of favor, I have to be careful in what company I say that here, but you know, there's a rethink going on, so there's an opportunity, isn't I there? I think that's true. Yeah. And, it, and we're seeing some of it. Mm. We're seeing some of it that people don't want really to go into that direction and get back. But I think it has to be in the leadership at the very high level to really believe in the value of knowledge and science. Yes, please, from this side. Yes, please, sir. Um, I want to touch on the, um, the earlier points you made about... Your the, name is... Sorry, I'm Gregory Oxen. Um, I'm a student at the University of Copenhagen um, in Denmark. Um, touch on the earlier points you made on the younger generation. Um, now, I always believe that there's been a switch from the mechanical optimism of older generations to more of a fighting optimism of my generation, and we saw that in the Arab Spring. Um, but on the question of leadership, what do, you, what do you know now that you wish you had known when you were in our generation? that you think we can use to help you know, make our lives better. Yeah, well, I, I, don't we all in that position? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, lots of things. We would need another half an hour to, uh, to cover this. But, I, I, you know, as I said before, I think for every generation, they have their own language, their own way of doing things. The important thing are the fundamentals of education. If you are in Africa, if you are in UK, if you are in the US, there are fundamentals that you have to learn. For example, even um, I complain about this a lot in the Arab world. Uh, they don't respect time. I work with time on the femtosecond, so it's very, very short. Uh, but, you know, you give an appointment to somebody and uh, they might be late one hour uh, and things of that sort. I think all of this comes as a result of educational and cultural changes, but it would be a mistake and some people have written about that. It would be a mistake to think that it's a genetic in origin and that this generation cannot change or this people cannot change. Yes, please. Another one from this side. Yes, please. Hi, me. You could say um, your name and where you're from. Uh, yes, Elizabeth Esty from the United States as a congressional candidate, thinking very much about these issues. And one of the reasons I'm running is great concern about the hostility to science, actually, that we're seeing mm. in the political class right now. So some observations of what we do when the politics are in fact anti-science and there isn't support as we see right now for even basic research and development, which I think is going to be critical to, as you said, the man on the moon. Any sort of political leadership is going to have to, I think, elevate science and that will require politicians to not attack it, but in fact. Well, could you give me a, um, a justification as to how you uh, <coughs> see it as being attacked? Oh, certainly. I mean, the, the House of Representatives called for cuts in basic research and development. Right. So just, I mean, out and out saying we are not supporting science. This is not important for us to do. We are not going to support uh, aid money abroad that would be building schools, that would be facilitating exactly what you were describing, diverting not 10% but we're talking. Do you think that's austerity or do you think it's uh, a, a political attack? Oh, it's a political attack. I mean, that's actually very contrary to what Bush was doing, which was quite the reverse, wasn't it? Wasn't, wasn't he trying to uh, spearhead uh, scientific development? So do you think it's this administration is what I'm asking? No, I'm not saying the administration. I think there's actually, it, currently in the Republican Party, at least in the House of Representatives, there is an anti-science screen. Oh, interesting. We're seeing it reflected in the, in the debates right now on the Republican side that there's, a very, well, there's hostility to science. Oh, interesting. Well, from what I know, uh, I know that the fact that the White House and certainly the leadership of uh, President Obama is very much interested in support of science. And they feel, the president himself feels, that there 
will be a serious problem as far as innovation in America if we were to cut in the support even of basic science. But the problem, as you mentioned, comes in the Congress. I'm not sure it's a hostility, to be fair, but I think what it is is that they want to cut across the board. So they will say 20% across the board. But as everybody knows, if you want to maintain your innovation, you cannot cut education to the same extent as you will do with other uh, things. So I think there got to be a realization that you will not go forward unless you invest really in the uh, knowledge of the future. And other countries are doing that very well. And that's a scary part of it. Yes, please. Any other questions from over here? I think there was somebody here. Any other questions? Um, my name is Linda Gumray. I'm a communications consultant for pharmaceutical companies. I have a slight problem with what we tell students to do once they've finished their science degree. Mm. Uh, working in pharma, research and development, your chemistry graduates, there's, it's hard for them to get jobs now. I have a nephew who's just about to finish studying physics and we have an education issue in the UK where they're being offered to pay off your student grant 20,000 if you go into teaching. He has a fantastic physics brain. Mm. Is that almost a waste? It's hard. It's a difficult time. Yeah, what happens if you educate people but you can't have the jobs, you don't have the jobs to offer them? Yeah. Right. Are we not telling them where to go once they have that degree? Well, you know, mm. it's... Uh, it's a very serious problem, and in fact, if you take the developing world, it's even worse. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the number of people graduating, Egypt has 90 million, roughly, 90 million now. Uh, as I said, at least 30%. I mean, there are certainly millions who are university graduates, but they don't have jobs. But it seems to me this short-sighted, because on the part of the administration. Because if you look in places like China, for example, 1.3 billion. And everybody would have said that it, you can't find jobs for these people. Yet, they develop programs in energy. They develop uh, programs in land cultivation. They develop programs in small businesses. So all of these graduates can be really in useful function. And that's why there is the outsourcing right now to China in, in essentially in every industry. So it seems to me it's a critical that the leadership at the top be thinking not only in reforming the education, but also finding the new avenues that you can uh, proceed with. I hope I haven't cut anybody off, but I think there we must leave it. I'm getting the nod from behind. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining. It has, there has, I think, been some consensus that education needs promoting, but also you're right in saying, of course, you can't educate people and then not give them just jobs, yeah, but, sure. but also jobs to which they, they should aspire. So we need to be rock stars. <laughs> Thank you very much That's indeed. That's a good note. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>